Uh, everyone has an opinion because people feel ownership of the wheel of time. You know what I mean? Like they love the books and they're emotionally attached to them. And so my brother had a friend at work who was like, heard that I was doing the show and sent me a preemptive set of notes, what I might be doing wrong and how I should fix it. So So you're a longtime fan of the series, correct? Like, tell me about how you came to love the wheel of time. It was actually a book that was given to me by my mom. Um, And so reading it the first time with her, you know, like I have a very emotional relationship with this series because the two of us read it together. And, you know, it's something that that I think speaks really highly of the series that like like a a young gay teenager and his um, middle aged mom could read the book together and both find things that they love in it. (laughs) That's very cute. So you were a producer on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., among other things, but this is really sort of your first venture into, like, high fantasy, which is, like, a whole different world. Like, what sort of learning curve or, like, what did you have to sort of get up to speed on really fast? Um, I think, you know, obviously the scale of this show is different than anything that I've done before and that any of us that work on it have done. It's just so big. Um you really is like you're making four movies back to back more so than uh, necessarily just a television show. And I think that something that, you know, I got a lot of experience from, from my other shows as well was, uh, you know, just how to exist in a genre space and how to, how to hopefully put the exposition into your show that you need to, if people need to understand the rules of your world, but try to always approach them from an emotional perspective. So people are learning about these rules and some kind of scene that they can care about or with characters that they can care about why they care about these rules. You've also sort of had like a really solid relationship, like with the fans back and forth, even since this was announced, like since you were sort of announced on the project. Why do you think that's so important? And like, how have you been sort of listening to them, but like hearing your own stuff on the side, you know, like, how do you sort of weave that together? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I'm lucky that the Wheel of Time fan base is so incredible. Like, it's a very warm space. It's a very open space. It's a lot of people that really care about these books and want to see it done well, which is the same thing that I want. Um, So it's always a very warm space to be in. And I'm sure that there will be times when it's not, because there will be ultimately things that they don't like that I've changed or that individuals don't like. But I do think that it's... um, as much as you can. And I've been able to much less with like my schedule getting more full, but the, the more that you can interact with the people who love this thing, like that's why I'm making it, you know, it, that's why we're working so many long hours is so that people who love this can see it. And I think it's um, silly to pretend that we're doing it for another reason, you know? Yeah, I want them to love the show. Like they read it 30 years ago and like they've loved it. Like I've loved it and my mom has loved it. Like you want, you want those people to like the show. And I also want to know, you know, like I ask questions sometimes too of like, what do you think about this? Or like what what's important to you? And I have a pretty good gauge for, you know, like you hear, I mean, being a showrunner, all you do is get notes on everything you do all day long, every day. So, you know, you, it, I don't mind, uh, I'm perfectly open to negative feedback as well. It's pretty easy to sort through stuff and kind of see, oh, this is something that seems like it's important to people. And especially at the beginning of the process, I use that a lot. I talked, I interviewed a lot of people who read the books and loved the books about what are moments that are iconic to you? What are the things that you have to see in the TV show? Um, and, and getting a handle on those so that we make sure that we deliver on those. Even if we can't deliver on everything, we can deliver on the most iconic and most important things. Are you getting notes from your mom? Oh, oh, oh my God, am I getting notes from my mom? No, she really does. She gives notes on it. I send her the scripts. <laughs> Uh, everyone has an opinion because people feel ownership of the wheel of time. You know what I mean? Like they love the books and they're emotionally attached to them. And so my brother had a friend at work who was like, heard that I was doing the show and sent me a preemptive set of notes of what I should, (laughs) what I should do and, um, what I might be doing wrong and how I should fix it. So I think people are invested and they want to, they want to see this pulled off. Right. (laughs) There are a couple changes from the books, though. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, the characters in the books were 17, but you guys aged them up a little bit. You know, we're really (laughs) making them feel like they're 21 more than 17. And so I think it's a significant age up in that it's only a few years, but there's a lot of life experience can sometimes come in those years. And so... 
um, you know, cha any change you make like that has ripple effects because we try to be really emotionally true to what these characters would be experiencing. So if you make a change like that, it also means that these characters have lived a little bit more of their lives. Um, and you have to see that input into the show. You can't just have people be 20 something, but behaving like 17 year olds or it won't feel right. So any of those changes we make, we have to see through the flutter effects of it too. So you have to be really cognizant about changes you make when you go into them so that you know what the consequences are and if you're willing to face them. You've also said that Logan is gonna have a more, I mean, apologies if I'm saying that wrong, is gonna have a oh, more prominent right. role in the series. Thank you, Emma. I'm, a, uh, you know, I do the best I can. There's a lot of names in this. You're doing. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, but it, you said he's going to have a bigger role in the series than he does in the books. Like, what can you tell me about that? Well, one thing that was important to me is, uh, you know, a lot of the world building stuff in the books has done is exposition and just sort, you know, like it's just talked about, like a character tells a story about what something happened or whatever. Um, and the idea of a man who can channel ends up becoming extremely important in the show. It's one of the defining pieces of the entire series. And so I wanted to show a man who could channel um, in the show so that people could start to understand what that feels like from a character perspective of seeing this guy. He exists in the books, but just bringing that his story out to the forefront a little bit more so people could understand what it means that a man can channel, what it means for him personally, what the consequences are in the world around him. You know, I, I wanted to make sure that we were clearly setting that up for the audience with a character that you could feel something for instead of just in exposition. Last question. The book series has over 2,700 named characters. Like, who's one that you're really itching to get on screen? <laughs> Avienda. <laughs> She's, she, uh, I'm really excited to see that character get to screen. She was one of my favorites in reading. The power inside you. All over the world, there are different names for it. But it's one thing. One power. And women who can touch it. We protect the world.